2017's Nier Automata may be one of the best games of the early 21st century. In this video, I'll cover some of the game's wider themes, and discuss why it serves as a shining example of the kind of brilliance only achievable by video games. Nier Automata is an action RPG sci-fi game with deep philosophical undertones. However, unlike a lot of this kind of science fiction, at its core, Automata still has a beating heart. It doesn't get so wrapped up in weighty themes or philosophy to become inaccessible. In fact, the game is often beautiful, even childlike, in its romance and wonder. Created through a joint venture between writer-director Yoko Taro and the studio behind such quality hack-and-slash titles as Bayonetta and Metal Gear Rising Platinum Games, Nier Automata is actually part of a series within a series. The first Nier was spun off of the action RPG series, Drakengard. But for the most part, despite all this baggage, Automata is a self-contained story. Set far in a post-apocalyptic future, you assume the role in Automata of androids who must clear planet Earth of robotic invaders, making it safe again for humanity to return. The game features not only the fantastic hack-and-slash action gameplay Platinum Games is famous for, but also a unique blend of elements taken from a diverse array of genres, from open-world games to RPGs. The result is that rare combination in video games of the best of both worlds. Automata draws you in with compelling controls and challenging boss fights, yet keeps you invested with no less compelling storytelling. Automata isn't only fun, it has something to say. And like all the best games, it says it through not only dialogue and cutscenes, but also mechanics and gameplay. The game opens with an instantly iconic mini soliloquy by one of its protagonists, the all purpose battle android 2B. 2B, having thoughts well beyond her station, remarks that the principle of entropy is such a sad irony, she's often wondered if she'll ever get the chance to kill whatever sad excuse for a god designed our universe this way. It's a fascinating glimpse into many of the wider game's major themes, with 2B's talk of everything having been created with a purpose, a design, and a flawed one at that. Why do we exist? What makes humanity any different from objects? Except that we lack a clearly defined purpose, except that we will someday die. These existential questions take on new meaning when they're spoken from an android, especially an android built to destroy. The game then opens in the midst of a combat operation, which immediately drives home with bitter irony to B's point, and it does so through gameplay. Flying into enemy territory without much of a real idea who the enemy is or why we oppose them, we can only watch as one by one other androids that may as well be us get annihilated right before our eyes. The opening is worth dwelling on at length because it so perfectly conveys 2B's words in a direct and interactive way. It gradually becomes clear that climate change has flooded what used to be a giant industrial center, a place of purposeful construction and design, now overflows with ruin. This begins a game-wide conceit whereby machines take over former human facilities and appropriate human behaviors without truly understanding any of it. At first, it seems the only thing that stood the test of time in this universe is that most destructive purpose of all, war. Automata will be a game largely about war. In fact, an early idea for how the game would end would be displaying for the player messages from other players only taken from countries that the current player's country is at war with. We gradually learn that 2B, alongside her scanner Intel Android companion 9S, are fighting as humanity's proxy in a war against machines, which, in turn, were also created to be the proxies, except of aliens. The war has been waging for centuries, as what 2B's already described perfectly, yet inadvertently, as a never-ending spiral of life and death. 
This brings up the heavy influence, in addition to the existentialism, on the game of Zen Buddhism. But what makes Automata such a masterwork is these deeper themes are made directly accessible via mechanics, camera, and gameplay. The game's prologue does not allow players to save until they've cleared the first area and its boss. Not only does this force you to get down the controls before really starting, the more you die before clearing that hurdle, the more times you not only hear 2B's opening lines, but experience them for yourself. The release of Nirvana or Enlightenment, then, becomes part of moving forward. Otherwise, you find yourself trapped in that endless cycle of life and death. The question of design that 2B raises at the start we also find expressed through the way every single element of your HUD and even things like brightness settings and volume are part of 2B's system, fully integrated within both the story and the game. Near Automata's director, Yoko Taro, made an interesting comment during an interview. He pointed out the irony that, as games have tried to better replicate reality, they've only done so at the expense of story. That, he concludes, is because reality, objective reality, has no story. Objectivity and subjectivity are two different things. Yet, according to thinkers that influenced his game, like Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, it is precisely the subjectivity of experiencing life firsthand that gives any of it meaning for human beings. Taro said, There's a huge debate when it comes to games. Should we care more about story or freedom? Games are often designed after reality. They're trying to emulate and recreate reality, and reality means freedom. So why is it that when we add more freedom to a game, or take a step closer to reality, it has less story? That's simple. It's because reality has no story." End quote. What makes this quote important for understanding Near Automata is how it speaks to the division between the subjective, how things feel, and the objective, what things are. A story. Why does Taro imply that it necessarily restricts freedom and suppresses a full picture of reality? It's because a story depends on an audience and a storyteller. It depends on a specific, subjective interpretation of reality. But the more general freedom that you're given as a player through interactivity, the less precise control the creators arguably have over shaping how you subjectively experience that freedom. So how does Nier Automata address this conflict inherent to the medium? By controlling the story's context, so that no matter what you do, you remain inside it. If reality has no story, as Taro says, then the same objective elements can stay the same while how that story is told and what it's set up to mean changes. And that's how the objective-subjective divide is solved by this game. To avoid spoilers, though, I'll stick with one somewhat smaller example in particular, the repeat of the opening mission. In the first run, you play as 2B, and the way to progress is relatively linear. You're free to explore for items and kill or avoid enemies, but given that you gain rewards for destroying them, the impetus is on doing so. Little did you realize, though, the target was actually part of the old factory. So the context somewhat changes, which we experience interactively once 2B has to actually ascend the giant enemy's superstructure to get to 9S just as she did earlier when the same structure was still just part of an inanimate facility. But now, jump forward to the reprise of this scene. We open from a different vantage point, in a different context. Here, we start out not as 2B, not even as 9S, it seems, but instead as one of their enemies, a machine. And we're given the most subjective context possible, grief. Our brother, even though he's just a machine, we perceive as having just died. Our new avatar, the machine, can only rock his brother's lifeless body back and forth, begging him to spring back to life, 
to return to a condition that's more than just an object. Then we're given control. Playing as this adorable and tragic little nothing, we have to collect some oil in a bucket in the hopes it'll bring our brother back to life. We feel the sluggish frailty of this little being, physically through controlling them, while emotionally we're being moved by the hopelessness of his situation. Painstakingly we get the bucket, get the oil, and try taking it to our brother. We have to be careful not to spill it, or else the whole painful process will have to begin again. Carefully avoiding all obstacles, we make the long peregrination back to where we began. We can't help but notice ruefully how differently this area feels when seeing it from this machine's eyes. There are no sounds or signs of violence yet. It's tranquil, even calm. On the way, we must pass by countless heaps of other machines, just like us, piled up, lying dead. Then, at the climax of the scene, we pan out and hear 9S say, no amount of oil will make the other machine our brother. The context shifts. We realize, if we haven't already, that we're repeating history, the earlier scene, from 9S's point of view. This whole time, little did we realize, we were actually watching through 9S's eyes, not the machines. Then, in an echo of that perspective shift, 9S looks up and we can make out the Yorha strike team from the start of the game, far above our heads. This is what I mean about controlling the context. Freedom can be defined within set parameters like these, and these parameters will determine the subjective feel of the scenario without the devs having to micromanage every aspect of the player's possible actions. Because the player is a human and not a machine, the scenario will have a subjective impact. By keeping secrets from the player, only to reveal them as one was here, right at the opportune time, the writers and developers can maintain control over how the game experience feels while the player is also freed up to approach the scenario however we want. Nier Automata uses the android conceit as the ideal intermediary between the player and the game. Always in this game we find some form of expression for its inner essential conflict between objective and subjective reality, between experience and design, and that includes the interface and controls. At the end of the prologue, for example, we're confronted by the object of our very environment coming to life as the enemy we've been sent to destroy. Yet even though we, 2B and 9S, are ourselves nothing more than objects, as in machines, when 9S gets wounded, 2B behaves as though he and she are subjective, moral, mortal beings. The relationship that blooms on the battlefield between them over the course of the game is romantic and life-affirming in ways that Nier Automata only achieves by way of its multiple endings, player character swaps, recursion as in retellings of prior events, Mr. X, and other ludonarrative flourishes like a different game mode entirely when, as 9S, you hack into another machine's, for lack of a better word, mind. But if there's one truly important feature of the game and how it conveys this tension yet attraction between the planes of subject and object, if there's one element that truly makes this game a work of art, for me, it has to be Automata's camera. I've rarely have ever played a game that makes such meticulous and thoughtfully dynamic use of its many possible camera modes. Instead of providing a player-controlled camera all of the time like a typical modern game, Automata frequently forces overhead or sideways perspectives that give particular sequences a unique sense of importance, not to mention theatricality. I never knew camera angles by themselves could make illusions before. But with only a given angle, Automata almost feels like it's quoting the sensibilities and visual registers of other genres like shoot-'em-ups and bullet hells. Real arcadey influences you'd think would have no place in this cutting-edge Platinum Games action title. But not only do they fit in as references perfectly, they yet again bring the overarching themes through with clarity, simplicity, and grace. By limiting the player's freedom over complete control over the 3D visuals at all times, the game imposes special parameters that we are compelled to work within. Imposes, in other words, a context. After all, navigating and fighting in a more overhead, almost 2D perspective has a totally different gameplay feel than the exact same scenario playing out 
with full 3D camera control. In this regard, Automata uses features unique to the ludonarrative medium itself to convey a version of Taro's borderline philosophical claim that reality has no story. The machine we played as wasn't really alive, strictly speaking, objectively speaking, and that dead machine wasn't really our brother. But if that's really true, how do we know, in turn, that we, playing at home, are alive either? How do we know our thoughts, our sense of self, our perception of having free will, aren't all well-crafted simulations or myths? The point Automata seems to make is ultimately we should be less invested in this story of objective reality, of the thing in itself, because unless that story is told, interpreted, and experienced, it has no meaning at all. It could be told in an indefinite, different, possible number of ways, and it won't be really real until someone thinks, at least, they've experienced it. Just like someone or something isn't fully your dead brother, one way or the other, until you subjectively think of them as such. Or think you are, anyway. This brings us back to where we began, just in a different context, namely war. War and conflict generally often hinge on disagreements over who is objectively wrong or right. But what Automata seems to suggest is maybe objectively wrong or right doesn't exist. Maybe obsessions with it just wind up objectifying and dehumanizing our enemies. Maybe 9S has no more right to claim he really exists, or is really thinking, than the machine has to consider that pile of trash his dead brother. If we let go of the idea that reality has a story, an objective story, and accept that all stories at bottom involve subjective and existential leaps into faith, as the philosopher Kierkegaard would have called it, maybe it will become easier to exist at the same time as our so-called enemies. Automata often makes light of human vanity and cherishes the childlike wonder with the world we'd all be better off recovering. These old Japanese game genres that Automata is referencing can be traced back, debatably, to the fact that during World War II, Japanese pilots, unlike those of the Allies, had to rely on the naked eye and manual maneuvering in the air. These games are exactly like the androids and machines in Automata, evolved as war machines and systems, yet totally divorced from the subjective essence of war, of their referent point, trapped in an endless cycle of life's deaths, game overs, and continues, fighting out a virtual war long after every single living human in that war has died or stopped flying. In fact, the specter of World War II is everywhere in Automata. Flying inside one of the mechs provided by your organization Yorha, you'll face down armadas and squadrons of enemy ships over cerulean vistas that drip with imagery taken from the Pacific Campaign. The atmosphere of total war permeates Yorha, and the game shows how quickly this blinding patriotism and militarization of society can make humans resemble war machines and, ironically, vice versa. Automata recontextualizes the mind versus machine question within war, as we see our side assume only we are truly capable of rational thought. This chauvinism is quickly challenged in the game as we begin to encounter more and more of the other side that seem no less capable of acting outside their programming than we androids. This humanistic insight by Automata borrows from some of the ideas of Alan Turing, to suggest we should have faith in the appearance of intelligence, because at the end of the day, there's no better way to confirm our own. The famous Turing test is actually a thought experiment that suggests, should a machine ever gain enough sophistication as to become indistinguishable from a thinking, real human being, we should conclude that machine is no less capable of thought than our own minds are. Automata uses these philosophy of mind ideas to ultimately argue for compassion, humility, and respect even when it comes to how we think about our enemies. Through its many possible endings and big story reveals that occur long after you've started the game, Automata keeps 2B and all the rest's original purpose for construction a secret. We come to realize that our existence has been experienced before we've uncovered our essence. In other words, our reason for existing, our design. So even though we play the game in the role of artificial humans, our experiences, our memories, still have meaning, even though we experience them without really knowing what we were created to do. 
and the same goes for our so-called enemies, the machines. As Sartre puts it, human beings are those who propel themselves towards a future and are aware they're doing so. Humanity is a project which possesses a subjective life, a life that may be objective in what can't be changed or how it physically works, yet remains also to some extent subjective, quote, because the limitations on human nature are lived and are nothing if humanity does not live them, does not freely determine themselves and their existence in relation to them, end quote. Now, Taro claims he doesn't read philosophers themselves, but rather readers digest versions of their ideas that he consumes on the toilet. But however he learned the principles of existentialism, they are faithfully rendered by Automata in both story and gameplay. There's a big choice you have to make at the very end of the true ending of the game, and you have to make it willingly, which speaks to existentialism poignantly and greatly. Another relevant quote from an existential thinker here comes from Sartre's lover and life companion, Simone de Beauvoir. She framed this philosophy of existentialism in feminized terms, declaring that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. We might be seeing this idea in the development of 2B's character as she grows from a programmed killing machine who flat out rejects female pronouns and human honorifics to a woman with genuine feelings for others and a newfound sense of identity with herself. Whether or not those feelings are pre-programmed is beside the point. The last thinker with direct influence on Automata that I'll discuss here is Blaise Pascal. Now, Pascal is especially important given he all but single-handedly represents, not unlike another thinker, René Descartes, the trajectory that natural philosophy would take through the centuries as it transformed into modern science, with its specific importance to the growth of computer science and philosophy of mind. Pascal was one of the first people to invent the mechanical calculator. A programming language has been named in his honor, as well as a geometric pattern known as Pascal's Triangle. Pascal struggled with how to rationalize the Christian doctrine that we'd call today intelligent design. The way we begin Automata with the question of design poetically shifts the role in this equation from God to human creators, and as that God's creations, humans to machines. But even without a God to explain why everything is the way it is, even we humans, who've become arguably equivalent as creators to gods, are ourselves creations of the natural world. So many of the same questions from Pascal's day remain today, even though they've become more secular, they're no easier to answer. Think of it like this. A science experiment in the 1980s seemingly proved that unconscious brain activity takes place as a necessary preamble to conscious decision making. So are we in charge or our brains? And if there's no difference between ourselves and our brains, as science suggests, do we, the we we perceive, really exist or matter at all? Are we a cause or just an effect by the natural world? For Pascal, how human beings decide to do this or that is predetermined either by our nature or by that of our creator, God. Yet he also believed that the act of freely deciding to be moral was still possible through the transcendental grace of God. We may be pre-programmed in terms of whether we have access to this grace for Pascal, who believed in a version of predestination, but the point is we will want to be moral, so in that sense the decision to act remains free, not because it is objectively determined, but subjectively, even empirically, experienced. This idea speaks directly to the inner workings of video games, which, after all, only provoke genuine emotional meaning in the player subjectively through an experience that the game gives you via objective, literal scripts. In this regard, Pascal could be called an important precursor to existentialism. He believed even in science that facts are only obtained secondhand through reason and the senses. In other words, through subjectively experiencing them and deciding for ourselves via rational tests using, say, the scientific method, what they may actually mean. Considering how beautifully all these ideas are conveyed in a direct way in Nier Automata, it's clear that this game is a true masterpiece of philosophical science fiction. When you also consider Automata's unbelievable score, which easily stands shoulder to shoulder with the best music from any Final Fantasy or any other JRPG, its memorable and iconic characters like the thoughtful pacifist Pascal, the villain turned fellow protagonist A2, and many more, 
and the game's epic sweeping set pieces and boss battles, it's clear that Yoko Taro and Platinum Games have created with Nier Automata a true instant classic for the modern era. That thing I mentioned that's asked of the player to willingly choose to do at the very end of the game may be one of the most artistically relevant and moving scenarios from any game to be released in decades. Nier Automata is a very full experience emotionally. It can be despondent, romantic, gentle, violent, sexy, sad, and joyful. It's everything that makes us human and makes life worth living in interactive, experiential form. So play it if you get the chance. Until next time, boss.